Film Journey's talking point, Prometheus is a better sci-fi film than Alien. During the run-up to its release, Prometheus garnered huge interest and support from sci-fi fans, Ridley Scott fans, fans of the Alien franchise, and fans of Michael Fassbender. In order to understand why Prometheus was such a big deal for so many people, we need a mini-history lesson. In 1979, Ridley Scott directed Alien. The world went nuts. Critical reception was good, box office was great, and word of mouth was astounding. The film features a crew of a commercial spaceship being picked off one by one by an alien creature that is hardly ever seen on screen. The tension in the film is so effective that 35 years of ever quicker pacing hasn't really dated it. It didn't happen overnight, but the film was destined to become a classic held as legendary among science fiction fans. It starred, as we probably all know, Sigourney Weaver as a tough, deep space commercial crewman with Massive's inner strength. Alien was followed in 1986 by Aliens, this time directed by James Cameron. Here, the central conceit of the previous film was turned on its head by introducing lots of alien creatures. Instead of the single xenomorph creature lurking in the shadows, preying on the lone female, there were now hundreds of them fighting against a troop of colonial marines. You can't make this stuff up. Except they did, and it worked. After this were two more direct sequels, Alien 3 in 1992 and Alien Resurrection in 1997, plus a number of franchise tie-ins with the Predator series, numerous computer games, books and comics, all reaching to a point where there was a bit of franchise lethargy with everyone bar the true die-hard fans. It was to this backdrop that Ridley Scott kept saying he would not return to sci-fi, often quoted as saying that he couldn't do anything fresh. So when it was announced that he was not only returning to sci-fi, but that this new film would be in some way linked to the Alien universe, fans got very excited very quickly. Possibly too quickly. Now before we talk about Prometheus in depth, let me start by saying this. The film isn't perfect. There are some errors that could have been ironed out. However, we still stand by the feeling that this is a sci-fi film that will last. People will come back to this movie in years to come and continue to get enjoyment out of it. Numi Replace, girl with the dragon tattoo, plays a scientist with a strong religious faith called Elizabeth Shaw. She and her boyfriend and scientific partner Charlie, played by Logan Marshall Green, are searching all over Earth to find the answer to one of the biggest questions. Who created us? Who created life? Her character's faith drives everything she does, whereas his scientific focus, combined with a sense of thrill-seeking, makes him the perfect counter for her. Together they work, and together they discover sets of pictograms from all over the globe, drawn hundreds of years apart, but all containing a matching cluster of shapes. They believe that this is not only evidence of a higher being or creator interacting with humans for thousands of years, but also an indication of where these beings exist. A map? As another character calls it, no, Shaw replies. It's an invitation. Now, the film doesn't specifically answer if these drawings are an invitation to come and find them or a warning to stay away from them. But not long after the expedition crew reach their destination, travelling on the spaceship Prometheus, things start to unravel at an alarming pace. Crew members disappear, exploring alien tunnels. Other crew members reappear, not just disfigured, but mutated and angry and start to attack and destroy the ship and the crew. As a backdrop to this action, you still have the characters trying to figure out who are these beings, which they call engineers. Why have they made us? What's causing the mutations? Eventually, Shaw and the ship's captain Yannick, played by Idris Elba from Mandela Long Walk to Freedom, realise that the engineers, or someone else, for some reason, intended to use the mutation goo that the crew have found in thousands of vessels to destroy mankind. The planet they have found is a weapons store. Ridley Scott has said that he was fascinated by Gruenard Island, more commonly known as Anthrax Island, which is a small Scottish island that was used for testing anthrax in the Second World War. The island was uninhabited and as a result of the tests, highly contaminated with nobody allowed to visit it. The entire island was quarantined. It's since been decontaminated, but the idea led Ridley to think of the engineers, or possibly someone else, using this planet in the same way. By the end of the film, a single engineer has awoken from hundreds of years of hypersleep and starts up a spaceship to head to Earth. His perceived mission is to release this deadly mutation goo to wipe out mankind. I won't spoil what happens at the end of the film, because I really want those who haven't seen this film to watch it clean. And I also would love for people who have seen it to go back and watch it again, because there is so much more to be seen on repeat viewings. 
The whole mission is funded by a character called Wayland, played by Guy Pearce. Uh, yes, the guy from Neighbours. He is a man who has achieved much throughout his very long life. His age is not given in the film, but he has been in hypersleep for many years. So think around the 100-year-old mark. He believes he's done good. He's invented weapons technologies that's helped stop war. He's invented biochemical technologies and advanced robotics to the point where synthetic humans are not only commonplace, but they're almost lifelike. In short, he believes he is equal to a god. Maybe now he feels that he's worth repaying, perhaps with everlasting life. Now in Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan who sided with Zeus. There are many versions of the Prometheus story in Greek mythology, but the most common is probably Prometheus Bound, in which Prometheus steals fire as a gift for mankind or mortals, and is therefore punished by Zeus. Prometheus always asserts that Zeus wanted to obliterate mankind, but that he, Prometheus, managed to stop him with the theft. Whilst mankind is saved, Zeus punishes Prometheus with eternal torture. Bit heavy for a popcorn film, isn't it? But then again, is it? If this is a true sci-fi film, shouldn't it work on many different levels? What are some of those levels? Prometheus, in Greek mythology, saved mankind. Prometheus the ship saves mankind. Prometheus, in Greek mythology, saved mankind. The engineers could have been hinting to mankind in their pictograms not to visit the planet used as a weapons storage facility, thus saving mankind. Their eternal torture? Well, they were all but wiped out by the creatures made from the mutation goo. Which leaves the secondary question, who is Zeus in this interpretation? Perhaps we'll find that out in the sequel. The story of Prometheus in Greek mythology is very concerned with that struggle between parent and child the codependency of each for the other, but the natural point in the cycle where a child wants to grow and develop and strike out on their own. Consider Numi's character here, Elizabeth Shaw, and her strong religious beliefs. In a scene that didn't quite make the final theatrical cut of the film, Michael Fassbender, who plays an android called David, asks Shaw why, after everything that has happened with the engineer, all the death and destruction, does she still want to find and wear her cross? Despite wanting to know more, she still needs that dependency. And finally, what about the theft of fire theory? Guy Pearce's character, Wayland, creates David, an extremely lifelike android which angers the engineer. I'll leave you to figure out the meaning of that one. There are many more similarities between the two and the possibility for lots of fascinating conversations over what it all means. But here's the thing, and this is why we defend this film. I'm sure some watching will simply be thinking, it's just a film. This dude is reading way too much into it all. Which is true. On some levels, it's just a film. It can be watched, enjoyed, and then forgotten. It's an entertaining 120 minutes. But it also nudges us to question ourselves, our beginnings, our purpose. And that conversation goes far beyond this film, far beyond what Ridley Scott or Numi Replace intended us to think about. And isn't that what great sci-fi should do? What great art should do? Agree? Disagree? Chip in with your thoughts in the comments section on YouTube, or tweet your thoughts to us at Film Journeys. Remember to play nice and respect everyone's opinion, whether it aligns with yours or not. Finally, don't forget to tell your friends about this video if you think they'll find it interesting. Thanks for listening.